there are standard indications that are used to initiate treatment for patients uh, with CLL, and these are um, indications uh, or criteria that we've used for many years. They haven't changed uh, over the many years, uh, over the many recent years. <clears throat> and the, the reason that they're used is because there hasn't been any treatments that's been shown that, there haven't been any studies that have shown that early treatment changes the outcome or changes survival. So earlier treatment doesn't improve or um, prolong survival over waiting until they have an indication for treatment. And the indication for treatments uh, are relatively simple. So there are, they are disease-related uh, sy symptoms that need to go away uh, when patients are treated effectively. Those usually are night sweats, fatigue, unintentional weight loss, sometimes fever uh, without any evidence of infection. Um, so the symptoms can be a trigger. Symptoms can be a trigger and are important, generally speaking, for patients who have lower stage uh, or earlier stage disease. And then the other indications for treatment are pr um, progressive anemia, and I usually use a hemoglobin of 10, uh, or progressive thrombocytopenia, and I usually use a platelet count of 100,000. Realizing that the, the, counts, the blood counts can fluctuate, so I usually don't select, a treat, select to treatment or determine to treatment just based on one determination. I will usually repeat the labs after a month or two to confirm that the hemoglobin is in fact below 10 and or the platelet count is consistently below 100,000 before I will uh, initiate treatment. Um, um, in terms of um, goals of treatment, I think it's a lot of the discussion lately has been, particularly for the older patient population, is what are your goals of therapy and clarifying the goals of therapy for that patient group because there are options uh, to manage those patients. And the goals can include deep remission with a treatment-free interval. So this is a, a goal that is typically achieved with chemoimmunotherapy, where patients will get a defined course of treatment. And there are a variety of chemoimmunotherapy regimens that have been evaluated and are effective. For example, chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab or bendamustine plus rituximab. In this strategy, patients receive a defined treatment period of six months to a year of chemoimmunotherapy. Typically, they'll go into remission, and then they have a period of remission that is generally between two and four or five years where they don't need any treatment, they're just getting follow-up, um, and they do relatively well during that remission period. Eventually, the disease is likely to come back and to need retreatment. Um, the other strategy and goal is disease control. So in, the, in this situation, patients uh, are treated with the small molecule inhibitors, drugs like ibrutinib, where they go on treatment and it's highly effective, particularly ibrutinib is highly effective at controlling the disease, bringing down the amount of disease, but it doesn't get patients into a good deep remission to the point where we're talking about stopping treatment for them. So with ibrutinib, for example, patients go on this treatment and they stay on treatment until either they come off for toxicity or it doesn't work any longer and they need to switch treatments because it's progressing. Usually in that situation, the progression, it's many years that they're on uh, this treatment. So it's sort of a decision and a discussion with, uh, with patients um, which strategy they prefer and each of them has advantages or disadvantages. Similar to the patients who are young, who have an unmutated V-gene, my preference is to manage the older population with the small molecule inhibitors because we get very, very good disease control and it saves them exposure to chemotherapy, chemoimmunotherapy, and leaves other options open later.